All right. Work as has been said. Great. Okay, so the time is now 5.06 p.m. I call to order the September 12, 2023 Policy and Governance Committee meeting. Um, good evening, and thank you to you all for being here. I am Jonathan Briggs, Vice Chair of the Policy and Governance Committee uh, and member of the board. It brings me great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's meeting, and I look forward to our work tonight. Um, so we'll now have introductions of the committee members, starting with board members, then administration staff, then the board office staff, and then the board legal counsel. So I'll start with uh, Ms. Uh, Chair of the full committee. Um, I'm sorry, actually, uh, I'm going to start with um, Rain Rivera, one of our, our student board members who's here. Rain? Hello, can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm so sorry. My Wi-Fi went out for a quick second. Can you please repeat yourself? <laughs> My apologies. Uh, we're just going around and doing brief introductions um, so you can kick us off for today. Okay, awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Ray Rivera Forbes, and I'm the 43rd student member of the Prince George's County Board of Education. I am extremely excited to be on this committee, um, especially to work in policy. It's extremely important to me. So I, I love being here. And yeah, I'm looking forward to this year. We'll go with our other board members that are on. Um, and we can go with uh, Dr. Juanita Miller. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to our second meeting of the Policy and Governance Committee. And I look forward to us moving forward. Um, the uh, chair did send us uh, an outline for this year, which is very good. And um, I'm ready to roll. Is it okay if I go? Good evening. My name is Judy McKenzie, Mary Chair of the School Board, and I'm an ex officio member of this committee. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Miller. Good Support. evening. I was just trying, I was trying to make sure that the committee had gone. I'm so sorry. Good evening. I am Dr. Zipporah Miller. I am the District 5 representative on the board and I'm a guest on this committee. Great board office staff. Hi, my name is Sharon Dent. I'm the director of the board office. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Hi, everyone. Cindy Adlin, administrative secretary to the office <laughs> and um, support to the policy and governance committee. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dennis Whitley III. I'm an attorney or a partner at the law firm of Shipley and Horn, and we are board counsel. And good evening. I'm Robin Welsh, um, the Director of Government Relations, Compliance, and Procedures. Great. And I want to acknowledge that we had another board member join. So, um, uh, uh, Vice Chair Walker, if you'd like to just briefly introduce yourself, we'd appreciate it. Hi, everyone. I'm Lolita E. Walker. I'm the Vice Chair I'm representing District 9. Happy to be here. Thank you. Great. And uh, finally, I, I do believe we have our um, uh, chief of staff on the line as well. So I'd love to just take a second if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Hi, good evening, everyone. I apologize I'm not uh, on camera. I am Quincy Boyd. I am the chief of staff. Thanks so much for uh, allowing me to be here. Okay, so colleagues, before I call for a motion to adopt tonight's agenda, please note that there was an emergency item added to the discussion uh, titled New Policy Professional Development for Board Members. Um, may I have a motion to adopt the amended meeting agenda for September 12, 2023? I'll question before we go. Um, I didn't get a response from the chair, but there was a public, uh, and, and tell me how we will treat it. When we get a public um, memorandum, well, someone from the public sends in a, a, a statement because they're unable to attend. And they asked, uh, they sent us a document, a bill that, uh, not a bill, a policy that they uh, would like to see amended. Um, will that be, I had asked the chair, would that be added also, or will it have to wait until our next policy and governance meeting? 
Okay, just to are you aware of what I'm talking about? Yeah, just to clarify, you're talking about a constituent may have written in testimony for tonight's public Correct. testimony, and then they submitted it as a comment. So Correct. I believe it's going to be documented as a comment for tonight, but I'll um, turn it over to you, uh, Ms. Den, if you want to give clarity there. You turned it over to who? Uh, he, he sent it. He sent it to me. We have it. We actually have it at, on listed on a public comment, the document, and it'll be forwarded to the um, the chair of the policy and governance committee to review with the skip constituent um, the concerns or what the policy and the the chair will then provide an update on whether there's going to be any action taken on the constituent concern. Okay, well, that's my question. That was my question to him. And okay. so it looks like he's not here. He didn't respond. I haven't re received a response from him. So we can move forward. I just wanted to know because I didn't get a response. And it's something that can wait until the next meeting anyway. Great. Okay, well, I'm going to move back to um, the motion that I uh, just requested. So may I have a motion to adopt the amended meeting agenda for September 12, 2023? I Is move that we accept the adopted amendment. Uh, um, the adopted agenda as amended for uh, Tuesday, September 12, 2023. Is there a second? Second. It has been adopted, uh, moved and, and seconded to adopt the amended meeting agenda for September 12, 2023. Are there any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes. The agenda is adopted. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the August 22, 2023 meeting minutes? I move to adopt the uh, August, what was the date? 2022. 2022, 20, or the 22nd uh, of 2023 yeah. minutes um, of the Policy and Governance Board meeting. Is there a second? A second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the August 22, 2023 meeting minutes. Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes. The minutes are approved. Okay, so I'm going to move. Chair, I just wanted to comment that those were some excellent minutes that were provided to us. I didn't find any errors, not even a typo. Great. <laughs> we appreciate that. And that's always, and that, that goes to our board staff. So that is a shout out to that's them. That's why I wanted it on the record for all of the work that you all do for us. Um, and so I'm now actually going to clearly indicate when I'm moving on to the next item. So uh, moving on to item 2.0, public comment on agenda and non-agenda items. Uh, this is 2.1 and 2.2. There is one written public comment this evening and it can be found on the board docs. Um, registered public comment speakers can be live, pre-recorded using video or audio or written. Um, and so that's what we have for today. It was the one comment that was mentioned. Uh, so we're going to move on to item 3.0, legislative updates. Um, and so for 3.1, update on MAVE Legislative Committee meetings. Uh, I yield the floor to Mrs. Welsh to update us on the MAVE Legislative Committee meeting. Good evening. Um, there was a MAVE Legislative Committee meeting yesterday morning. And at that meeting, it was sort of like the intro meeting to the beginning of the meetings that they'll begin having for the rest of the year during the General Assembly. Starting in the fall, they actually start doing the meetings, though. And they, um, uh, John Woolens, who is the um, director who does government relations, he shared a lot of um, concern, a lot of background information for board members because there was also new board members in attendance. Um, related to previous bills that have passed and history related to, for example, maintenance of effort um, and for school systems. He then went into talking about some of the priorities for 2024. And one of the big ones has to do with the local funding escalator. So um, there had been um, back in 21, a law that passed that basically um, held the school system, the, the counties uh, accountable uh, for funding um, uh, as for the statewide average uh, per pupil spending. And then they gave an increase above, they required an increase of, of funding above the MOE from the previous year of 2.5%. So this coming FY 2024, which is this upcoming year, this year, but going forward, they, the, um, the blueprint, the 2020 blueprint has actually eliminated the local funding escalator. 
And so that won't be calculated in when when you're talking about maintenance of effort for county county funding. So that's a big concern for it should be a big concern for all of the school systems because the other thing is I think it's like 2025 or 26, the blueprint money, blueprint money begins to start to fade away. So that could cause a big gap in funding. So that is going to be one of their major priority um, uh, concerns. And there is conversation about possibly introducing the idea of an inflation factor for the uh, maintenance of effort so that counties would have to look at what the sort of like what's the cost of living and inc you know increase infl inflation that's happened over the past year that would have be used to calculate what their maintenance of effort is to uh, to offset the cost for things in the school system because we're constantly school system is constantly being anytime we buy or purchase or you know contract a service it's being impacted by inflation so that was probably the major thing he talked about and then he also talked about uh, state funding projects and the concern to the a big concern one of it has to do with the pre preschools and the expansion of preschools and the construction costs that are involved in ensuring that we have enough facilities available to have all these preschool programs. And then what does that mean in terms of the construction costs? And then also CTE programs and having adequate funding for the kinds of buildings and facilities you might need for uh, certain CTE programs. So that was uh, the majority of the, the conversation, although he did go back to reinforce what the uh, Maryland Association Board of Eds, what their priorities, their basic priorities always are. And one of them has to do with making sure that um, MABE supports the government governance authority of local boards. And so anything that is like taking away from the authority of a, of a local board, they would oppose. Um, and then um, they also talk about, of course, increased funding for construction and renovation projects. And then they also talk about the fact that the the legislation we do not want to see legislation that dictates curriculum because even though the state state sets the standards MSD sets the standards for what needs to be taught it has always been a local priority or prerogative to be able to choose how they're going to go about teaching it and what instructional materials things like that they're going to use so that was sort of the essence of that meeting um, and they'll probably actually provide probably at the next meeting, meeting after that more detailed analysis of what their priorities are for this upcoming year. Thank you so much, Ms. Welsh. Uh, that was Mrs. Welsh. Uh, that was, um, you know, um, <laughs> a number of different topics and I think all very important. So we look forward to further updates, um, particularly on the funding piece, which is really important. Uh, so I'm going to move to 3.2 blueprint implementation update. Um, but I see a note here is that uh, Chair Fields was going to provide that update on the blueprint implementation. So I'm going to table this. I'm not sure if that's the correct term that I use, but I'm going to table this one and we can come back to it once uh, Chair Fields is here to provide that update. And I'm going to move on to 3.3 legislative sessions. Excuse me, uh, Vice Chair Briggs. I, I noticed that we have a new board member that's uh, joined us. I don't know if you want to have her introduce herself. Yes. Um, and, oh, yes, uh, Ms. Rao. Yeah. Do you want to just take a second to really quickly introduce yourself? Welcome. Hi, good evening. I'm new to this meeting. Um, I'm one of the newest board members um, appointed by the Prince George's County Council. Um, just really happy to be here um, serving today. I apologize for being tardy. I was dealing with my own transportation issue with my child. No problem at all. Um, and Ms. Rout, will you be joining this committee or another? I mean, you're just visiting or have you been assigned to this committee? Oh, I haven't been assigned to this committee. I was invited um, to attend today for okay. um, a purpose of corresponding um, with the chair on an item that I believe that is going to be um, under the agenda later on. I, in the agenda. Yeah, I'll cut in here. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Rout, for that. Um, and yes, I mentioned at the, at the top of the meeting that we have a new policy that was added. Um, which we are going to discuss later to, uh, later in the agenda. Uh, so we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but just bringing us back to where we were right now, we're at 3.3 legislative sessions, which Chair Fields was also going to provide an update for. Uh, so we'll also table that one for when he arrives, uh, unless, Ms. Welsh, you'd like to interject here. I could share at least the... Um... 
the schedule wait a minute is this the correct the uh legislative update should have the timeline on it yes the timeline for development of okay. the legislative um platform or you know priority or position paper just so that we have it because i know we the at the last meeting they requested the timeline so tonight um was um and i think when um uh, board member fields arrives that he, he will then be discussing some of the legislative priorities from the board's perspective and then at the 21st board meeting i believe he plans to uh, have a discussion then with the full board about legislative priorities and then on october 17th we um the committee should discuss and approve what they think should be the legislative platform and then move it to the full board for approval at the october 28th meeting and i think i have a note in here that says um, that, oh, that, I, yes. So our office, my office has already begun having conversations with each of the division chiefs also to find from their perspective what are, would be legislative priorities, either things they would support or oppose so that we can take information from what the board members have provided and then also incorporate what the, the uh, division chiefs have also provided to come up with um, a um, position paper or a platform, whatever, that sort of incorporates those things. And then um, the other thing I want to point out is that in addition to then taking it, bringing it eventually back to the committee and then to the board, I think it's going to be critically important that somewhere along that process, once the draft is developed, that it would be very good to be able to send it out to, like, say, our nonprofit organizations and, like, uh, our, our faith-based organizations, just so that the community, like, PCAC also should have the opportunity to see it, so that if there's any input that the community wants to provide before we finalize it, before the board would finalize and votes on it, we can hear from them, and then that can help us in terms of finalizing the draft and incorporating everything that's important for Prince George's County Public Schools. Um, Ms. Well, Mrs. Welsh, thank you so much for that rundown. I think this is just really important and kind of want to emphasize um, the impact that I think this will have on our community. I do see a hand, so I'm going to recognize you, Vice Chair Walker. Hey, thank you um, so much. Uh, Ms. Welsh, thank you for that overview. I had a question about, do you happen to know how we um, give input for our faith-based community, faith-based faith -based communities that are included in this rundown? Is that something we can provide you? So for instance, District 9, I know the churches that are within District 9, do I provide that to you or do you already have what that looks like for each our, of the districts so we can help get it out? So our communication, I did check with our communications office and they actually do have a database that uh, in, includes all those things and they're going to be putting that together for us so that we can um, share the, the um, legislative position with all of those groups. Thank you so much. And um, also, if you can add, if you can give input also for our um, Greek letter organizations, too, which actually have um, a, a big range inside of our um, communities as well. Thank you. Which, which organization? I didn't quite hear. Um, sororities and fraternities oh. um, okay. inside Thank of our um, communities. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much. And Ms. Wells, one thing I, I did want to just clarify was, uh, were unions a part of that kind of uh, stakeholder group that you're going to be reaching out to? Certainly we can, we could share it with the unions too. Yeah, just would love to just make sure that they also have input, especially the educators union, um, so that we're aligned kind of across the board on all aspects of education. Um, so thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. So if there aren't any other questions uh, here, um, I'm going to move on to uh, item 4.0, which is items for discussion. And there are four items for discussion today. Um, so colleagues, we will adhere to the five minute and three minute rules of discussion. Uh, and I'm going to start off with uh, 4.1 policy 9250 attorneys. Um, I'll yield the floor to Mrs. Welsh to update us on policy 9250 attorneys. So uh, Cindy, do you mind uh, posting it so we can just go through it? So um, we did go through that. We did go over this and discuss it at the last um at the August uh, Policy and Governance Committee meeting. And pretty much it's very similar to what it was previously. I think the important point is to point out is that the major change in this policy is to indicate that not only would we have a council 
to um, support the board and, uh, you know, a, a deal with legal matters that affect the board itself, the whole board. Um, but we also are required now by House Bill 1079 to um, uh, retain counsel to defend a board member who's involved in litigation because of the member service on the board and the in the member's official capacity on the board. And in the litigation, if it's determined during that litigation that the board member was acting within the scope of the member's authority without malice and gross negligence, then it would be the responsibility of the board to pay all council fees and reasonable and related expenses. So uh, if you just scroll down a little bit, Cindy, I think uh, it has definitions. And if you keep going, I think the big, um, where we ended up, keep keep scrolling down just a little bit. Um, I had to, okay, stop. Can you go, scroll back up? Sorry, you're just a little too fast. Take it back to maybe two. Uh, right there, perfect. Anyway, the big conversation we had at the last meeting had to do with um, ensuring that a board member had the opportunity to have some say in who it was they were going to retain uh, to defend them, but also ensuring that we did not go above a certain a certain amount that we didn't have board members picking, let's say, attorneys that cost like $500 per hour, billable hours of $500 per hour versus a, a more reasonable rate. And so the question came was, can we look at the possibility of having a range maybe of uh, billable hours, the cost that would be, and also the process for um, ensuring that it's an equitable process so that the board members have the opportunity to pick who they want. So I went back first to the law to look at it more closely. And actually it says the board is required to retain the board, the council to defend the, um, the, the, um, board members. So in order for that to occur, that I did talk to purchasing and basically purchasing would uh, put out a solicitation and within the, and so I also checked to find out what is considered a reasonable range of, of costs for uh, legal fees in this area. And I talked to general counsel because they do, they do, um, contract out a lot of the, the cases they have. So they're using outside counsel. And they said the range really runs from about 250 to 315. So I put in there that the, they, an, an RFP would be issued with the solicitation stating that the attorney's fees can't be greater than $315 an hour. And then the board would actually um, pre, in this RFP P identify, say, five attorneys that pre-qualify, and they would have them then on, on hold like so that if the board member needed to um, need an attorney in terms of defending, they have the opportunity to pick among all any one of the five. It would be equitable because any board member who, that would need the defense has the right to pick out among any of the five. And so it's not like one board member gets this person or that, but they have equal choice. And then the the limit on the cost is in the high end of what consider, is considered to be reasonable, just to ensure that they can get um get you know the, one of the attorneys that they they really would like to have within the five. Um, so that was the question that came up in the last meeting. And so um, I did work with purchasing an OGC and it appears like this might be the best solution. Now, if you have other suggestions or ideas, certainly, you know, don't hesitate to share them. Um, I was just trying to really address what, you know, what came up in the conversation last, at the last meeting. Um, hang oh, on. Okay. Well, well, before Any you want questions afterwards or now? Well, we're gonna we're gonna move to questions in just a second. I just want to introduce that point. But uh, thank you so much, Ms. Welsh, for sharing all of that. The floor is now open for discussion and comments. Um, so, um, colleagues, I'm, I'll go in the order of the hands that I saw first. I'm gonna start with Vice Chair Walker. Um, thank you so much, um, Ms. Welsh. Thank you. You are so thorough. I absolutely love it. I always appreciate you. Um, the question that I have for you is, is our own, I don't see bills for our own legal counsel, but do they fit within that hourly rate? I just want to make sure that they fit. I, I thought that they were over that rate, but I don't know for sure. So if you can just confirm that they actually fit within that range or were within that, that would be amazing. Do you mean, so when you say our legal counsel, are you referencing our like the our board, board legal, legal counsel? Oh. Yeah, Shipley and Horn. Okay. And the reason know. why I'm asking that, not so much to get in, I mean, we really should know how much they charge, but um, it's more because I just want to make sure that we're equitable in the, if somebody else is choosing somebody, then I want to make sure at least if they cost more than 350 or 315, 
then we might need to take a look at our range. I hope that makes sense. Thank May you. I inject something, Mr. Briggs, Mr. Chair? To piggyback on her question, so Robert can answer it all at one time. Sure, sure. Um, my understanding in terms of this bill is uh, board members choosing or uh, having to select legal counsel to represent them in a case. The uh, the uh, legal counsel for the board represents the whole board, and right. they are under contract. So there's a difference between those two, the what's in this bill. Uh, that we're looking at this policy that we're looking at now and the contract that we have with um, our current legal counsel. Those are two separate entities. Am I correct? Ms. Is that the correct? So that is correct. The, the, the policy itself does address both because the, the policy originally did address the fact that the board itself could retain counsel to uh, you know work on legal issues that they have that they need counsel for. And but then it now incorporates also the fact that the board and the law does say retain. So the count the board would retain counsel, but it would in this instance not be to support the full board, but to defend an actual board member. Thank you. I think oh, that answered my question. So did you? I guess I'm asking. So are you saying? Um, did you ask that question because my original question was about Shipley and Horn in comparison and so where you were going is it's not really a comparison because they wouldn't be able to defend an individual anyway because they represent the board is was that your thought on questioning yes Dr. Miller okay yes. thank you and and um um board member Walker if you recall one of the questions I had at the last session was could a board member use board counsel and yes. conversation? We had decided absolutely not that it could be a conflict of interest. Perfect. So they said that we're not using board counsel to defend one of the board members. Love it. Okay. That's okay. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Okay. And I think it, it just for and the there's sake. a policy that governs that too. And if I can add one thing. Okay. If yes. And if we can just have a little bit of order here. So um, moving forward, if we can raise our hands and remain muted for just the person that's speaking, that'd be good. Just so that for those that are viewing, they have a, a you know, they clearly understand who's talking at the, at the one time. Um, so I'm going to move to um, Chair Mickensbury. Thank you. I just wanted to add that any board member that wanted to see the contract for Shipley and Horn, it is available to you. And within that contract, the hourly rate is there. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Anyone else would like to be recognized? My hand has been up, uh, Mr. Chair, before Ms. Uh, uh, Mickens Murray. I had tagged on to um, Board Member Walker because of the question she asked that Ms. Welch could clarify, and I didn't have to repeat that. But my um, my concern uh, or question is, uh, even though this the board this policy says that uh, we have to s send out an RFP, um, if in fact a board member decides, well, this is my lawyer that I want to represent, and they are willing to work within that the range that's in here, would that be allowed, or would it be considered contract? Um, well, I don't like to use the word, but how would that be uh, considered, Ms. Welch? You're on mute. The law does say that the uh, board must retain the um the the attorney. So I then our policy is saying that, and I agree with this because we do have a purchasing policy that says what we have to do for uh, retaining counsel. And so you would probably have to have them go through the whole RFP process. I mean, you still have to be setting something up, but I'm not sure. My concern would be to have to go through that entire process. Would they be ready? Would they be? Would they meet all the requalifications to end up being a counsel for that board member? And would they miss the opportunity to actually defend the board member versus having all of these pre-approved board members sitting sitting there ready to go, and you don't have any of that preliminary, all that RFP work and things you have to do? Because sometimes that's a little. It takes a little bit of time to get through that process. And but, that was but it's concern. certainly the decision of the board. Okay, thank you. 
Great. And I want to acknowledge that we have Chair Fields, uh, who has now joined us. So Chair Fields, I'd like to turn it over to you just for introductions and then to eventually hand it off to you. <laughs> sure. Um, please tell me where we are on the agenda. I'm waiting to receive the annotated agenda from Ms. Adley. Absolutely. So we, um, just for clarity's sake, we are at 4.1 policy 9250 attorneys. Um, we're just in the discussion portion of that in the agenda. And then we do have a table priority or table item, which is 3.2 blue point implementation, which you were going to provide an update on. So just we need to come back. Okay, to why don't we continue discussion on this item and then we'll go to the blueprint implementation. I see a hand up, uh, Dr. Zafora Miller. Good evening. Thank you so much, so much, um, Mr. Chair. I my question is more so a, a clarification clarification question. Robin, thank you again for being thorough. I just want to understand. So the um, law now states that the board would retain the attorney and not the board member who needs the attorney. Is that what I'm understanding? That does. You're right. It's the actual board that does retain that retains counsel. Okay, so let's let's put out there for equity, which I, I totally agree with, that you have the five, however many number, let, um, we said five, that you have available. What if those who are, have gone through the RFP process and a board member needs to be represented, and at that time, the five cannot, um, represent them for different reasons. Don't practice that type of law. I don't know. You know, what happens then? Because I know that um, attorneys have specialties. So what happens then? That's a very good question. I would have to do a little research to find out what, what would happen. I, you know, I, I was operating on or the recommendation from purchasing or what they thought would be the best way to go so that, that you would have access to these attorneys and possibly, um, Dennis, you might have you might have more specific. You know, you're in the world of private practice, so you might have more of a, a specific knowledge related to this topic that you could help with the question. As a from a practical standpoint, if the uh, board member was not happy with any of the five, or any of the five could not uh, handle the case, my recommendation is that the board member would come to the full board, present her case, his or her case, and request a waiver. I think that's what would happen in the real world. You remember, we cannot set a policy to cover everything. Policies are meant to cover the rule, not the exception. And, and, and makes to, sense. Oh, oh, so go ahead, Robin. I'm just sorry to piggyback on what Dennis just said. Is that also I did put in the in the policy that. Those pre-approved five members would, or five attorneys would have to be first approved by the full, full board. Mm -hmm. So there wouldn't be like just someone's in, individual decision on it. It would actually be the full board saying these are the five. So all the board members have a say in these five board members that would be considered the pre-approved board members. If it's five or whatever number you think you need to have. Mr. Chair. So what um Mr. Whitley just stated, would that be added as wording if the committee agrees that should the um, should the five not be able to represent the board member for whatever reason, then the board member would uh, need to um, request a waiver before the full board or something like that. I don't know if we need to actually put that in the policy, because if you say they can't for X, what if the reason is why? And I, I, again, remember, policies are meant to cover the rule, not the exception. Uh, you know, the board can do what it wants, but I don't necessarily think we need to be so, that, that we need to get so in the minutia. The board members hear and understand that if for some reason the five or 10 attorneys that are selected by the board, if you're not happy with that board, with that, with that list, or those attorneys are not available, you know that you have a $315 maximum to try to secure an attorney as long as you bring it to the board first. The contract has to be between the board and that attorney. So you can't go out and, and, and hire an attorney and then ask the board to cover it. You have to do what's required of bringing it to the board first and having the board retain that attorney if you want the board to pay for that attorney. But may I, 
Okay. No, I was just going to respond. It makes sense. May I? Okay. I, I see. I'll recognize uh, Dr. Miller. Okay. Juanita Miller. Uh, I just want to be clear uh, because I had asked this of Robin and I, I thought I understood. Whoever, um, uh, whether it's, I want my particular attorney, they would still have to go through the RFP process. So if a board member needs an attorney, they would have to instruct their uh, legal counsel to uh, go through that preliminary process, correct? Once they put the RFP out and you yes. say, I want you to be one of the five. So put your, put your, uh, put, yes, they would have to. Okay. I think that kind of tags onto what uh, Dr. The other Dr. Miller was uh, questioning. Thank you. Hey colleagues, any other questions, comments? Mr. Chair, hey there, colleagues, should we move? If there are no other questions or comments, I just had a couple of uh, comments. I just wanted to make sure the okay. board. Uh, okay, I see uh, Dr. Zipporah Miller's hand up. I see Dr. Uh, she's soon to be Dr. Lolita Walker's hands up. So we'll start with Dr. Zipporah Miller. Thank you. I don't want to belabor this. Uh, this is for Mr. Whitley. I agree 100% with what you said in terms of we can't be so rigid that we put all of this wording in. But in interpretation of the policy, I have witnessed where um, it has been said, well, the policy doesn't say that, you know? So where do we have the wiggle room? Don't have to answer it now, but I do agree that if you put too much in there, it becomes rigid. But at the same time, who would be responsible for interpreting where there is with not wiggle room, but saying, okay, so the five would not be able to represent you. You need to go before the full board to ask for a waiver. I will try to work with Ms. Welsh to see if we can come up with some language that's um, that covers that situation. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I recognize uh, Vice Chair Walker. You're good? Okay. Uh, Mr. Whitley, you said you had some comments on. I think Dr. Uh, Juanita Miller's hand is up. I don't know if that's uh, a new hand or an old hand before I get started. Well, I see the hand, but I don't see Dr. Miller, so why don't we... Okay. Oh, there she goes. Dr. Miller, is your hand up? You're on mute. Okay, her hand is down. Okay. Mr. Uh, Whitley. Yeah, I spoke with Robin with reference to this policy, and I do believe she's going to be adding a definition for uh, the phrase and defense, which I believe is the actual language that's used in House Bill 1079. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that the board was aware of that because I know that that was an issue. Was that the only thing that we discussed with reference to this, Robin? Yes. Okay. So, so just, uh, there will be an amendment to the, uh, policy and the definition for independence will be included. I thought she gave us that. No. It called Chair Mickens Murray, I see your mouth moving, but... I was just going to say it's mentioned in the document. It's just not under the definition piece. So I think that's what Dr. Miller is, is referencing because I read the document. Okay. Hey, colleagues, should we move uh, to action on this policy or keep it for further discussion? Is there a motion on the floor? Yes, I couldn't get to my mic fast enough. I'd like to move that um, we accept the policy with the amendments that have been presented to us. Second. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Uh, we will move this uh, on for further action. Okay, we're going to go back to um, item 3.2 um, on the agenda. And first, let me apologize for being late. Um, I try to keep one calendar because I have four. And for some reason on my one calendar, this showed up at six o'clock. So when the meeting started, I was in route. But I sincerely apologize. And I thank the vice chair for stepping in. And that's why we have a vice chair. 
Uh, so in those situations, uh, we have leadership across our board and very confident that um, even in the absence of the chair, business will get done. So in terms of the blueprint implementation, uh, let me say this. Um, we are about to approach uh, sort of where the, the rubber meets the road for the blueprint for Maryland's uh, future. Uh, there is a projected deficit uh, in Maryland uh, to the tune of about $1.9 billion. And so uh, it is going to be a question of legislative integrity and fidelity to the commitment that the legislature made to the children of Maryland to make sure that the blueprint is funded. And that is why it is going to be one of our priority issues in our legislative agenda this year uh, when the legislature convenes um, early next year. Uh, and I'm gonna move right into uh, item 3.3, uh, legislative sessions. And Ms. Adline, do you have the timeline available that you can share? Do I see Ms. Adline still on the screen? Ms. Adline? I think she's frozen. Give me a second to see. Hold on. Okay. So while we unfreeze her, <laughs> just, just let me talk about the strategy um, that the board is going to pursue this year. Every year, the legislature meets for 90 days, and it is during the fall when legislators begin to hear from constituents and from interest groups about their priorities. And when the legislature also, legislators also begin to fashion their own legislative priorities, we would like to be able to um, join that timetable so that we can present to the legislature a Prince George's County School District legislative agenda. We will work with the administration so that we speak with one voice in Annapolis. And so that when we go to Annapolis, we're speaking on behalf of the entire school system. And, and our plan is to have that agenda in place by the end of October so that we can have discussions with legislature, legislators in November. I've already had a conversation with the chair of the Prince Georgia's County legislative delegation. He knows that he is going to receive um, an agenda, a priority agenda from us. And we're doing this for, for public information. The reason why we're doing this is because as one of the state's largest public school districts, we should never be in the position of reacting to legislation that affects the children of our school district. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And I see Ms. Adeline back. Can you share the legislative timeline? And I want to thank Ms. Welsh uh, for working on this because, so this is what we're trying to do. At the September 21st board meeting, there's going to be discussion, discussion with the full board about their legislative priorities. Each board member is going to submit to the chair of the Policy and Governance Committee um, their three top legislative priorities. And the board will consider all of these priorities and determine which ones uh, truly are priorities for the district. I've already said that the blueprint for Maryland's future is a priority. Um, another priority uh, has to be school construction. Uh, we need to continue to push for the rebuilding of our schools in Prince George's County. We need the legislature to provide funding for that. We need our county council to get behind that. Uh, we just had a public hearing for a capital improvement plan. We had over 600 uh, Prince Georgians come on that Zoom. And many of them spoke about the needs um, in their neighborhoods for new schools. And we have some very old school buildings. So that is going to be a priority. Then on the October 17th, Prince George's uh, uh, Policy and Governance Committee meeting agenda, we're gonna discuss and approve the legislative agenda and move, vote to move forward to the full board for approval. At the October 28th board meeting, the board will vote on our legislative agenda. Now this is a very tight calendar, but it's one that we have to adhere to if we wanna have a relevant voice in Annapolis this year. Um, I intend to spend some significant time in Annapolis uh, during this session to make sure that when there are pertinent hearings that affect the issues that we have on our agenda, 
that our school system's voice will be heard on those matters. I also want to hear from the public, um, and I invite the public uh, to email me uh, so that if there is an agenda item that you think that should be on our legislative priorities, please let me know. Uh, this is an effort to really try to represent the Prince George's County School community, our parents, our taxpayers, and it's very important that we keep this an open process. And then if you'll see the note at the bottom that the Office of Government Relations, Compliance and Procedures will meet with each division chief to discuss legislative issues impacting their divisions. And based on the information provided by the committee, the board and division chiefs, OGC, OGRCP will develop a draft legislative platform paper to present at the October 17th Policy and Governance Committee. This is a team effort um, on the part of the board and the administration to make sure that we are speaking with a singular vote, voice uh, before uh, the legislature in Annapolis. Uh, you can stop sharing the screen now, Ms. Adeline, and I see a hand up. I will recognize the vice chair. Thanks so much, Chair um, Field. So I, I just wanted to clarify a few things um, for the sake of this public discussion, which is one that I spoke with my delegate, um, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Nicole Williams, um, about the fact that they're actually developing their bills and they're developing their legislative agendas in October. And so I just wanted to emphasize the point that they they likely have everything figured out before they go in in January. And this is really just the important time to kind of make sure that we're all aligned. The other thing I wanted to say was that Ms. Welsh did go over the legislative session pieces. I know you mentioned the public here and just wanted to say for those who've been listening this entire time that they're both aligned. So if you are a faith-based institution, for example, and you're saying I'm a member of the public, there is a process that was outlined earlier. And just want to make sure that we're um, you know, clear that that was that process is still in place. Thank you. And I thought I saw okay, uh, Ms. Welch. And actually, I just wanted to piggyback on what Board Members Briggs said related to the public that I have asked communications to share their database on like our faith based groups, our nonprofits, all that stuff. So we can, once we have a draft, we could even just send it to them to get any feedback they might have. Um, that we can then be, consider as we finalize the, uh, that draft. Thank you. We, we really have to make certain that Annapolis hears Prince George's County speak with one voice in terms of the direction of our school district. And I think that uh, given what we experienced last session, that we want to make sure that whatever decisions that are made in Annapolis and they may not always come out favorably for us in terms of, but we need to make sure that our elected representatives in Annapolis understand where we stand on these issues. Um, and we're still looking at legislation that was passed last session to make sure that we're implementing policies in accordance with the law as it now stands. So this is just a, a matter of us being vigilant and doing our due diligence. I see uh, our student board member's hand, uh, board member uh, Rivera Forbes, I recognize you. Yes, thank you, um, Chair Fields. So I just wanted to say publicly that this is something that is very important to the students and with it being very important to us, we would like to go and speak there as well. So as a student member of the board, I'm going to take up that task and ensuring students know the dates when we're going to testify before you know our delegation and our our representatives to ensure that they're understanding that students want this too. It's not just our board members that are speaking, but we're speaking with them as well. And I think that will greatly make an impact because it's showing that this is affecting our community and this is what we need. So like I said, as the student member of the board, that is something I will do. And I will be working with you, Chair Fields, to make sure that happens. Absolutely, and I wanna work with you uh, as a student member of the board, because I would like to do a, a hearing for students where we can hold a hearing in a school and I will attend that hearing so that we can invite students because I'd like to hear from the students themselves um, that that I think that is important. We have uh, our school district is one of the few that has a student member of the board with the extent of voting privilege that you have. And so you are a full participatory member of this board. And I want to make sure that we always incorporate not just your voice, but the voice of students uh, throughout Prince George's, Prince George's County. So that is something that 
I'll be reaching out to you so we can schedule within this timeline. And I'd like to do it at a school uh, where we can set up that student public hearing. Uh, Vice Chair Walker. You're on mute. Vice Chair, you're on mute. Hi, I, am I off? <laughs> no, now you. Yes, I'm off. Thank you so much. <laughs> Listen, when you're on a cell phone, it's the worst trying to get that uh, thing at the bottom to come up. Anyway, thank you so much. Um, Chair, I was listening to you about two of our priorities that have to be on there about school construction and also our blueprint. And I was just wondering if you could also consider a no miss being our um, the board's add into the superintendent's um, process that be like a no miss before we start ad adding additional. So that's one that I wanted to ask if that could be a consideration um, as well. Thank you. Well, absolutely. And that's something as board members we have discussed uh, and I think it's it's a proper return of a responsibility um, that other district boards have. And it's high time that um, our board be given the opportunity. Now, look, we're going to we're going to keep superintendent house as long as we can, because we don't want to go through that process again. But when the day comes that we have to, um, I think that uh, the board should have the authority um, to uh, select the superintendent. Um, any other questions? Dr. Miller, why do you develop? I just wanted to, to big, piggyback on what you just said, uh, Chair Fields, in terms of uh, selection. Um, we will have to work as a, a governing committee on uh, the restructuring or amending of, of uh, HB 1107 which gave a uh, certain authority to the county executive. And uh, we also have to update our, I'm, I'm going to say this at every meeting until Robin comes in and says, Juanita, it's in print, uh, this updating our handbook to include a lot of this new legislation. So um, my, uh, my point to you would be that we need to uh, look at that particular quote state policy and uh, work towards uh, amending it because that caused us a lot of uh, grief this time in the selection of the superintendent. And um, well, that's my point for that, 1107. And, and I appreciate that. And one of the reasons why we have board members with varying experiences is when you have a former legislator, uh, we wanna make sure that we use that expertise um, to advance our cause. Um, in Annapolis. And I, I do want to make this final point about legislative agenda and a larger point. Um, there is talk amongst uh, the County Executive Association of uh, wanting to have some authority over blueprint spending uh, in the state of Maryland. Um, and I will say this publicly, I think that we have to have a hands-off approach to education dollars that as elected uh, boards of education, it is important that we maintain authority and control and to leave those, those decisions in the hand of educators who know best, our superintendents who know best. And so um, that is a fight that is going to happen this legislative session. I am just letting everyone know. Uh, there was an article in Maryland's Matters where it was clear that the county executives are looking to do this. Um, and I think that it is a further encroachment upon the independence and authority of school districts. Um, I see Dr. Miller's hand. I, I don't mean to monopolize with a lot of questions, but this is the forum for doing it. And I appreciate your uh, comment, uh, Mr. Fields, because this is what has happened to uh, education and boards across the country. They have become politicized. And the more we as a board don't fight back, or allow our legislators to move forward with making the, these policies, then we're giving away our power. And I think I've said this before in reference to uh, some other uh, issues and policies that have been uh, put, put out by the uh, state that uh, govern how we operate as a board. And it's time for us to step up to the plate 
and start taking back our authority, which has been diminished. Thank Most you. definitely. And, and, and we are going to transition to an all elected board, which means this board will represent the will of the people in terms of their representative voice. And so we need to make certain that the board maintains its independence and authority because you speak for the children of Prince George's County and no other government body does that. Not, neither the county council, neither the county executive's office, neither members of the legislature. You speak for the children of this county, and we have to make sure that we maintain that independence. And Mr. Um, Dale, if like, the, one more thing before we go to the next thing. Yes. You keep saying for the children, that's true. But we also have to uh, make policy or be responsible for policy that protects uh, the personnel that have to work with our, our scholars. So I'd just like for us to continue to say our scholars and personnel. I'm Duly going to noted. transition into my car. So thank you all. I'll stay in touch. Thank you. So let's move on to agenda item uh, four. I believe we're at 4.2. Uh, Policy 9360, meetings of the board. I yield the floor to Ms. Welsh to update us on policy 9360. So uh, with 9360, I think, um, um, well, I know that board mem member Walker had requested that I incorporate some language into this um, uh, bylaw that said that um, the uh, expectation um, for board members not to be uh, texting during the board meeting unless it were like an emergency situation. So um Cindy, if you scroll down, I think it's like page 11, that language is there because, and it's sort of highlighted in a, a dull yellowish color. So if you keep scrolling down, you have many pages to go through. I think you're only on page two right now. Here. Can you back up a second? Oh, that's page 10. I'm sorry. Keep going. Yes. There it is. There you go. So in that section, I for G, it said uh, board, board of Education member and public comments at board meetings was the title of that section. So I wrote Board of Education member engagement and public comments at board meetings. And then this is the language that I added, that board members are expected to be engaged in the discussion and presentations that occur during a board meeting. At no time during the meeting should board members text each other about what is being discussed or presented. Texting is only allowed in an emergency which, situation in which a board member, um, I should say, is responding to a family member or friend who is attempting to contact the board member. Now I can change that if whatever, but I was trying to capture what uh, board member Walker had said at the last meeting. And then and then I have one other change. So if you scroll down a little bit further in bright yellow, I think there's a highlight there. You should see it. It's in, uh, hold on a second, Miss Cindy. It's um I should have tabbed it here. Um do we have the right version? And, um Agenda preparation. I had highlighted this. I don't know if it, you'll see it on yours. Page seven. And there is a, it'll tell you that it was deleted too. So if you keep, what page are you on? Six, keep going to page seven. Um. Seven, but it might be totally a different agenda setting. It has to do with agenda preparation. 
So if you keep going, and maybe it's the next one, agenda, wherever agenda preparation is, it's a chain. Keep going. It's right after that. Oh, there, there you go. go. Um, if agenda, um, proposed agenda items. So I deleted uh, what it says, uh, board members will be notified of the agenda preparation meeting schedule. And then it says, and may also attend the meeting. I deleted and may also attend the meeting. And the reason I did that, and I can't, I don't know, this is, I hate to say it, we have too many track changes in here to be able to track it, but it is on my foot copy, it shows deleted. The reason I took that out is for the same reason we had a conversation about the planning meeting for the policy and governance committee. You can't have all board member, all committee members there because you will end up with an open meetings violation. If you have the a quorum there at the meeting discussing them, you'd have to actually make the, like our planning meeting an open meeting to discuss what's going to happen in the meeting. So the same thing applies to the board of education. If in fact you have a meeting to set the agenda, it's one thing for the board chair and the vice chair to be in attendance, to work with the superintendent and staff to come up with the agenda for the board meeting. But if you have all the board members there, uh, then in essence, you are having another meeting and the Open Meetings Act applies. So now you're talking about having an agenda planning, open meeting, and then an actual meeting after that. So that is why that item was deleted where it says, and the board members may attend these meetings so that we do not have any Open Meetings um, Act violations. Thank you, Ms. Welsh. The floor is now open for discussion and comments. Colleagues, any comments? Dr. Zipporah Miller. Good. Thank you. I don't know what's going on. Thank you, um, Ms. Welsh. I wanted to co comment on the part about May 10th because I know those me the meetings are the meetings of the board. And um, I do agree that if we have too many, if we have quorum, then we have to have an open meeting, which is not what we want. But could we consider, or should I, the committee consider having some, the language stay the same. However, they need to notify the chair and vice chair if they wish to attend the meeting. That way, if there's more than whatever number it is, chair and vice chair ha can can say, not this time, because I think that there are times when there's a board member who is maybe passionate about something and wants to articulate it at the agenda setting meeting. So to give the board members an opportunity to be able to speak about um, in, in the agenda setting, however, the chair and the vice chair would determine to ensure that they are still in compliance of not violating OMA. So um, there are some Open Meeting Act uh, compliance, the cases that have come up. And in essence, they actually talk about, and I would want to follow up with, and Dennis might himself might know the answer to this, but definitely I would want to follow, follow up with our Office of General Counsel. But they talk about once you're three or more, even though it's not a quorum, still three or more public officials, uh, when if they're meeting, then you're talking about having a public meeting, which then has to be open. So I, for precautionary stay, stay but I, I will absolutely double check with OGC, unless Dennis, you want to chime in right now um, and uh, um, to double check on that. I'll reach out to Darnell as well. I'm not as familiar with being three or more, it's typically a quorum. But if you've seen some recent case law where they've taken it down to three or more, I guess I can talk to the general counsel about that as well. Okay. I have a question. One second, please. We recognize uh, Chair Mickey Murray, whose hand was raised. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Fields. Um, I think if if the board member who wants to attend the meeting is working through um, the administration and has been able to articulate why something should be on the agenda or even through myself or, or Lolita. I don't think I've ever said no to, to an agenda item. I think if uh, there's something unique about what the board member wants to bring and we discuss it and I still don't quite get it, then I think we should have a way for one board member uh, to attend um, an agenda setting meeting. Uh, giving some weight to what the issue is. 
So, um, but but I think when I look back at the uh, discussions that we've had in the, on the agenda, I think we put everything on the agenda that board members have wanted uh, to have on the agenda. And then I wanted to, I know we're talking about the agenda right now, but I wanted to just add for texting. Uh, this last board meeting, Mia texted me a lot, which was very helpful to managing that public hearing. So I, I just need you to, to understand that, that that was meaningful texting because as people left and people came and it, it just made it a smoother process. So I don't know if, if there is a way to, maybe if, if uh, Lolita, I are chairing the meeting or any uh, chair, maybe we could have some language in there that allows that because I just thought that was very helpful. So I just wanted to put those two things on the table. Thanks, okay. Chair, and I and I rec and I recognize uh, Dr. Wadden, Nita Miller next, and then Ms. Wells. But perhaps we can have some language uh, that, uh, in the exception of uh, texting related to uh, the conduct of the meeting, mm -hmm. so that there is a difference between that texting and personal texting. Okay, uh, Dr. Miller. Yes, I wanted to go back to the agenda setting issue. Uh, we have, a, there's a policy, I'm driving, and if I wasn't driving, I'd be able to turn to it. But we have a policy that says uh, any board member can attend, attend uh, an agenda setting meeting if so desired. So for us to say that, you know, put a limit on it, there's nothing in our policy that states what, uh, how many um, can attend or, um, well, it just it does say attend, and see that's where you get into definitions because I can attend something, but I may not necessarily be able to participate. And I agree with uh, the comment that if in fact we have something uh, in uh, an item that we would like to have placed on the agenda, then the appropriate protocol would be to put it in writing to the chair and vice chair. And um, if that is not followed through, then you go back. But we cannot sit here right now and you know make a, a policy without saying we're going to amend the current policy. I sure wish I had my I wasn't in my car, but um oh I've made a note of it, Dr. Dr. Miller, and we will page, look at that. I can tell you it's in the handbook, page 15 and 16 deals with agenda setting. So if you go to that, it will clear it clearly tells you. What uh, the, uh, it talks about attendance. It also talks about how items are placed on the agenda. So let's be very clear as this committee evolves into uh, amending and creating policy, let's make sure that we uh, are in line with what the state is because Maine uh, gave uh, workshops last year and year before that. But in one of their workshops, we had a, a, a long um, discussion about what constitutes a quorum and what constitutes uh, having a quote, uh, a meeting that would be um, in violation of OMA in terms of uh, the number of board members gathering anywhere. And even uh, through um, uh, text, me no, not text, well, text messages and emails. So I just want okay. everyone to be uh, in tune to that. So we do have policy that governs um, attendance at uh, agenda setting. So I just want to make Duly sure noted. everybody knows the policies. Duly noted. And it looks like you're driving yourself home, uh, Dr. Miller, uh, based yes, on your picture. It looks like you're I, in the back seat there. I Amazing. Can, I, I can't direct you to the policy. Yeah. Oh, you A woman of many talents, I, I tell you. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Welsh. Um, well, first I was going to say to Dr. Miller, and I'd appreciate if you could send me that information that you said sitting in the handbook about that. But I was also planning to um, definitely do more research on this area. I mean, this isn't a closed book at this point in time. I will definitely do more research related to this topic. But I did want to point out, it's uh, based on um, Board Member Mickens Murray's comment, where she said about accepting uh, 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 the opportunity to, for board members to give agenda items. And you actually have under board agenda preparation that the yep. proposed agenda items must be supplied by board members 
um, and or the Prince George's County Public Schools Administration via the superintendent to the board chair at least seven business days before an open meeting. And then it also says a board member may submit no more than two new discussion items for a particular agenda item supplied after the seven business day deadline um, that, that, um, that can be added to the proposed agenda with the consent of the board chair. So it does, the language already in 9360 does provide um, you know, good opportunity for board members to put forward agenda items, um, certainly prior to the seven day um, to cut off, but also seven business day cut off, but also um, even afterwards, it provides that opportunity. So there is a good amount of opportunity for board members to give their, give their, um, you know, agenda items to the uh, board. And yes, we can, as uh, uh, Mr. Whitley said, we can work on the language related to the texting so that we can have something that is an exception in terms of the actually conducting the board meeting where it would be needed, so. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes Vice Chair uh, Briggs. Great, thank you so much, Chair uh, Field. So I just wanted to say for the texting piece and then also, um, to mention about some of the other things we're talking about um for the for the texting piece i recognized actually when we were at this most recent work session that i like had notes on my phone that i was referring back to i was looking at my phone for that reason and i felt that it wasn't really clear to know when someone's texting when someone's not I also had a few times where i got emails that went directly to my work phone i have a completely different federal government that I get. And I do need to like make sure that I, you know, check certain things at certain times. So there's just these unique moments where it's like, it, it's not always going to be that easy to say when someone is or isn't texting, or they might need to look at their phone or it might be a quick thing, right? Like I need to look and see what that email said. Maybe I need to step away. So I just want to make sure that the policy is like, uh, not too restrictive where it, you know, it, it really is meeting the purpose, which is, you know, for reasons that are like coordinating around things that we should have talked about, that makes sense, but not to kind of eliminate the opportunity altogether to have a phone. The other thing I was going to say was in the operating um, operating manual that the superintendent and his team put out, there's a lot of details in there about how many board members can be uh, in, a, in a room before it's, you know, considered a, a violation of OMA, um, as well as I think some of the other things we talked about. So it might just be a good reference point for some folks um, if you kind of do control F or, you know, um, control fine on your computer, you can easily look up like OMA violations or uh, some of the other pieces to find information quickly. Thank you. And I think the point that you, I think the point that you made uh, the end about stepping away. So I think that we also have to be cognizant of that we are in a public meeting. So if we do have to text or make a call, we should simply remove ourselves so that we don't become a distraction um, to the meeting. And I think that's just a matter of, of decorum for the board. Uh, chair recognizes Dr. Zipporah Miller. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to piggyback on, on the texting, but I think you covered it in terms of the distraction because we recognize uh, we have um, parents on, uh, you know, sometimes you work later, so we get it, but it's just about being the distraction. I believe the intent, and I'm not on the committee, but I believe the intent of this was to ensure that if it was something that we were discussing that has to do with what the board is discussing, there shouldn't be texts going back and forth where uh, one board member is texting another board member their opinion. That should be voiced out loud for the public to hear. Um, and I believe you know it's a violation of OMA when we are texting the information, it should be said out loud. And that's the, I, I believe the intent of the texting, that the texting needs to um cease because we we want the the um public to be a part of the conversation um the other part was um i think it was uh board chair mickens murray who mentioned if consider leaving the may in because i i could probably ask how many times are people asked to go to an agenda setting probably once maybe twice i don't think that they ever get requests for that it's very it's slim to none but if the chair and the vice chair could be the gatekeepers in terms of, hey, there's three of us here, so no, we, we, we can't have someone in. But there will may be a time, very rarely, but there may be times when chair or vice chair might say, this one I do need you to come in to articulate it during agenda setting. So I, I would like the committee to consider leaving the May in there and um, chair and vice chair could be um, 
govern themselves accordingly with understanding what the uh, wh when we are allowed or not allowed to, so as not to violate OMA. Other comments? Yes, I have one. Dr. Miller? Uh, again, the policy is already stated, those who desire. Now, what we need to determine is the definition of attend and what would constitute uh, attendance uh, as um, a public hearing, I mean, in, you know, uh, under OMA compliance, because I think we, we really are digging deep with OMA these days, but I'm glad we are aware of it. Uh, but the other thing, again, let's look at the policy we have now. And then in terms of the texting, uh, that's something we may not be able to control, but again, it is a courtesy and a professional courtesy to our constituents to be giving full attention to our board meeting as opposed to sending texts or responding back and forth to texts. Now, unless it's an emergency, they go out of the room uh, and respond. But to sit it during a meeting and someone is giving a presentation and board members sitting in, in, on uh, computers and texting, that I think is uh, a, a, a a level of disrespect to our constituents. Let me say up front, I will try to exercise discipline as the Morgan State athletic season begins and I start getting texts for scores to not be a distraction uh, of screaming uh, when my Morgan Bears uh, are doing well. So colleagues, uh, if there are no other uh, questions or comments, uh, I'd entertain a motion uh, to move the action on this policy or keep it for further discussion. Is there a motion on the floor? So moved. What are you so moved? Please take the motion. Dr. Miller, I've got this. Thank you. Sorry. You know me. I, I apologize. Vice Chair, please uh, restate the motion. Okay. The only thing I want to say is that if we're going to do that, then we need to be consistent, not here, but just in as a whole, because I know we've said that before, and then we'll sometimes say so move. Happy to restate it, though. So I think we are moving uh, recommendations made tonight by the Policy and Governance Committee for Policy uh, 9360 to be um, uh, adopted um, for this specific policy. Further action. Okay. Um, is there a second? I'm sorry, Ms. Welsh. Can I just ask a question, though? I, um, I am going to do more research on related to the Open Meeting Act and the whole idea of people, even if they're just attending the meeting, I mean, they're just sitting there, but they're not necessarily participating. What that means, uh, it means we're going through some uh, case law for the Open Meetings Act. So I don't know whether it's worthwhile bringing it back to discussion or whatever the final word is for, between the Board of Ed Attorney as well as OGC, um, that uh, you might end up with something that you're supposed to take action, but you're not ready to take action. So I, I don't know. I'm just saying, and as well as I will definitely make changes to the language related to the texting based on all the comments that were made today. Thank you. So I will ask the vice chair if he would be willing to amend his motion to bring policy 9360 back to the policy and governance committee meeting, uh, the next meeting for further discussion. So I amend my policy to bring policy 9360 back to the committee for further discussion. Is there a second? I second. I see Dr. Miller's hands raised. I just wanted to make a comment that over the two and a half years that I served as chair, there was only one occasion that a board member uh, uh, outside of the chair and vice chair that attended an agenda setting meeting. So sure. it's a rare occasion that board members, unless this is a, uh, a new thrust with uh, us carrying out our fiduciary responsibilities. I just, just want that to go on record. Okay, Chair Mickens, Mary. And for the record, I've only received one request and I granted it. So that's all I'm saying is it's not often. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor and it's been properly seconded to bring policy 9360 back to the next policy and governance committee meeting uh, for further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Thank you. Policy 9360 will be brought back to the next Policy and Governance Committee meeting for further discussion. Agenda item 4.3, a new policy. I'm sorry, I see Ms. Adeline's hands raised. Yeah, I have, sorry, Chair. I have two questions because I froze a little earlier and I couldn't tell what was happening. Item 3.2, the blueprint. Did we have an opportunity to speak about it? Yes, we did. Okay. And item 4.1, the policy 9250, did we take action or bring it back for further discussion? Uh, we took action. Thank you. So we will move to agenda item 4.3, the new policy, search and seizure. Um, I yield one second, please. I see Dr. Miller's hand up. Dr. Miller, is your hand up or did you just forget to take it down? I forgot to take it down. I apologize. Okay. I'm driving. Agenda item 4.3, 4 agenda item 4 .3, uh, new policy, search and seizure. I yield the floor to Ms. Welsh to update us on the new policy. Okay, so um, the policy, of course, starts off with a policy statement, and I, I do want to go over that because I think it's extremely important. Um, first of all, it says that the Board of Education is committed to providing a safe and secure learning environment from dangerous and illegal items, and those items that constitute a violation of uh, the Prince George's County Public Schools Code of Student Conduct. And then it also says, in furtherance of its commitment to provide a safe and secure learning environment, the board authorizes certain statutorily designated school officials to conduct reasonable a reasonable search of a student a student's personal belongings while on school property or during any school sponsor activity in accordance with Maryland law and this policy. But then the last piece is so that we're considering everything. We want safety and security, but at the same time, we recognize you the board recognizes the potential intrusiveness of these searches. And it's the board's expectation that such searches shall be conducted only with the proper authority and justification. And we'll go over that in a few minutes. And with due recognition and deference for the human dignity of those being searched. Because I think that's, we, we're talking about students here and not criminals. So I think it's really important that we keep that in the back of our mind as we go through this whole process. And then the whole purpose of the policy, of course, is just to provide the guidelines in the administration of the searches of students and students' possessions. Um, so I did provide definitions and just a little bit of education. The, um, the people who can actually conduct an actual search of a student would be the prince, and this is in law and in Comar. Um, there's uh, the principal, the assistant principal, and in this instance, um, it would be our safety and security services assistants. Um, the other safety and security services staff where we have um, the counselors and the lead safety and security uh, um, uh, safety and security services counselors, those two groups, both of them actually have the power to arrest. And by law, anyone that has that type of ability to be able to do that cannot be searching our students because this, again, it goes back to the fact that we're in a schoolhouse and we're not out there in the community. So anything related to law enforcement is they do not have the right, or also our uh, school resource officers cannot search. So this clarifies very clearly who can actually do a search, an actual search of a student or of students' belongings. And it does also say that the school resource officers and lead safety and security service counselors and, the, and then the other counselors uh, and any, of course, any other law enforcement officers are not considered authorized searchers. Uh, and then if you go continue through, there's a lot of definitions. I do believe one that's really important has to do with reasonable belief. So that is the standard that used for, for being able to search a student is that you actually have um, a reasonable belief that the student has whatever it is you think they might have. And that that's, that's when you start to search only when you have that reasonable belief and you can, and as for most part, it has to be an individualized reasonable belief. So you're, you're not going to take a group of kids and just say, we're going to search everyone to find such and such, but you actually have this belief about one particular uh, student. And uh, the things that need to be considered is both the nature of the suspicion you might have and the amount of and credibility of the evidence, and then all the relevant circumstances around the situation. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about um, both school property, school sponsored activities. It also talks about strip searches. And you'll see further in the policy what a strip search is. 
and this says in the definition what a strip search is, but later in the policy, it says that they are forbidden. Um, so, and then if you move forward and we uh, go to the actual standards, the first thing is, is that notice needs to be provided so that school administrators do provide notice to students at the beginning of each year, that year that the, these authorized searchers, which would be themselves and the assistant principal and the safety and security um, assistant, that they are authorized to conduct searches. And um, and when and all the pieces around it, and this notice will also need to be make sure that this it's included in the Prince George's County Public School Student Rights and Responsibility Handbooks that actually goes out in the beginning of the year. Um, and then if you go further down um, to the searches of students, it um, so all of this, of course, these protections are uh, based on the Fourth Amendment of the, Con of the U.S. Constitution. So we reference that. Um, and then it um, it's, again references the fact that it's still, you have to have proper authority to search and the justification to search, um, that it applies to all students on school property or at school-sponsored activities, especially also on field trips, and that the whole purpose is to preserve the order and ensure safety for our students, employees, and others in the building. Um, so it then gives you a little bit of information about when you can do a reasonable search. Um, and then um, at the, um, as far as the scope of the search, uh, generally speaking, the unless there's an immediate threat to the health and safety, I'm in number five, actually. Um, yes, um, no, this, this is, I think you're ahead of me. Yeah, except in situations where there's immediate threat to health, safety, and welfare of students, the scope of the search also has to be limited. So that's the least intrusive means that's available. And then uh, and going any further might be um, based on the evidence that you have and the infraction that is that, that you run across. So for example, if you, um, let's suppose that there's been rumors in the school that students have, a particular student has a vaping, a vaping, um, vaping equipment, I guess it's called, I don't know, or cigarettes, whatever, that they're not allowed to have in the school. And they, and then they um, take, they, the principal is made aware of this. Um, and there is uh, enough evidence to support that the student may have have been, have uh, like say cigarettes or the vaping things on them that it might justify that they would have the right to um, look say I don't know in the students' pockets or whatever and if nothing shows up that indicates that, that and it wouldn't be them actually getting in the pockets they would actually have the student empty their pockets and look and see and let's say nothing comes out of it but let's suppose they find I don't know some tobacco pieces or as they, you know, matches, something that would indicate that might justify like if it were a girl student, they the right to go and look into the student's purse, have the student actually empty her purse, they wouldn't look into it. So it's like each piece of evidence might indicate that you can go a little bit further in doing the search because it's becoming more reasonable to expect that you're going to find something. Now, in instances where you're talking about guns, things like that, then Generally speaking, that's where it says that's there. Then you're not going to be quite that stepwise because if there's any indication, you're going to want to we're, we're going to want staff to take immediate action because we certainly don't want students in our buildings or visitors for that matter in the buildings carrying any kind of weapons. So that just sort of lays that out. And I do want to point out there will be two administrative procedures and one that we'll talk in general about specific about search and seizure, which will have a lot of detail in it. And then the other one that has to do with the uh, metal detectors. So we'll have at least two administrative procedures addressing this policy. Um, then it goes on to talk about um, that all searches, uh, if it's the principal, he has to have a, another, he or she must have another person, a third person always present when you're doing a search. And then um, there it talks about that it is, the, it is, um, searchers, authorized searchers are prohibited prohibited from engaging in strip searches, searches of students or pat downs or any kind of search where you're having direct contact with students' body. 
So it, it, that's an important piece. There just recently was a case, I one in one of the school systems, maybe in Virginia, where I think a school authority went way over the board of what they were supposed to do with the students. So we want to ensure that doesn't happen in our school system. Um, and then the other thing is when a search is being conducted, we want to ensure that it doesn't disrupt the entire operation of the school. We really work to maintain the routine and minimize any embarrassment for the student that's being searched. And then uh, the other thing this does say is that the use of safety and security enhancement devices, which is our metal detectors, and other weapon detection systems are is permitted are permitted be, um, before students are allowed to enter into our high schools at this point. Later, if they ex eventually extend down into middle school or elementary, then we could make a change to the policy. So that is sort of the big picture. There is a section that then talks about searches on school property, uh, on which the school system does have the right to search uh, um, student desks, lockers, storage spaces, cubbies. Also, Prince George's County Public School issued uh, like uh, devices like the laptops or Chromebooks. And then finally, for field trips, when a teacher is going to on a field trip, the principal is responsible for ensuring that the teacher has been trained, and they put in and the principal must put in writing that he has authorized this the this teacher to um, be able to do a search if the need would occur while they're on this on the field trip, and then they must have a third person party when they do the um, the field trip uh, the searching. So that addresses that. It also then talks about the fact that the parent must be notified of the search. And then it does reference also if the student refuses to allow the search, then the, um, the, school, the school administrator or authorized teacher um, uh, must then inform either the parent or in instances where we actually think there's weapons or guns on the student, it might be that we're actually gonna be contacting the police right away. Um, and then if the student refuses, of course, it would be addressed through our uh, code of conduct, the Prince George's County Public Schools Code of Conduct. There is a section that requires that the superintendent ensure there's annual training to all authorized searchers uh, regarding the provisions of this policy and any of the administrative procedures that will go along with the policy, as well as making sure teachers who are going on field trips that they're trained to conduct searches. And then it says the, the superintendent is, is um is uh, shall establish administrative procedures for implementing this policy. So that is basically it in the nutshell. And I know uh, board member Fields, you were concerned about making sure that we had looked at other school systems. So I, I had in front of me, I said, by the time I finish the policy, I already have a book of papers of all the things I've reviewed, but I had Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, Montgomery County. I actually also had Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia's uh, school systems, um, policy that I looked at, um, as well as a couple other areas. So it was extremely helpful to have all those counties to see what they did. And this sort of picks up uh, the main points in all of those policies that I read. Thank you, Ms. Welch, for your work on this. Uh, and, and just for the public's information, um, the intent here is not to criminalize our students or put our students under a veil of suspicion. We are acknowledging the fact that in today's environment, there are instances when dangerous weapons can enter into a school building. And because we are having a trial run with new security features at some of our high schools, we felt it was necessary that there is a policy that speaks to the issue of taking a student's property if there is a suspicion. And that's what this is really trying to do. Um, and we want to make the public really aware of this, that we don't have an intent to really play big brother in our schools, but we hear the public's demands for greater safety in our schools, and we can only do so much. Um, and, and this is a part of the further discussion we will have as a policy and governance committee, that a lot of pressure is being put on school districts across the country for safety when a lot of the work that must be done to secure safety for our kids has to be done outside of the school building. It's, it has to be part of a larger community discussion about what is happening. Because before a weapon enters a building, there is something that happens before that. And we have to really have that broader discussion. So uh, the floor is now open for discussion and comments. And I see uh, Vice Chair Briggs' hand is up. 
Yes, thank you so much, Chair Fields. Um, I just want to say thank you, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Welsh, for um, the presentation and um, to just mention, I think the points that you made were um, uh, clear and thorough, and it seems like the policy for the most part, I need to read over it, but is is good. And uh, when you were talking, I was thinking through Chicago Public Schools. I had a hu huge scandal um, back in 2018 when I was in the state um, around these kind of search and seizure. It really was more so um, violations of adults in the building with students in in you know kind of spaces. So I just wanted to make sure that as we were kind of looking through this policy, we're not having any situations where students, whether it is opposite gender, um, students with a teacher and there's a search for whatever reason, or you know, with the assistant principal or principal, um, that we have things in there to really make sure that we're protecting that. I didn't hear you say anything about gender, but I'll look through it just to ensure, but I do know you said that there is no um, physical touching of students, which is, I think, an important factor. And the other thing I just want to say for uh, to um, Chair Fields' point um, around the uh, the metal detectors in schools, and I've, I've heard from a number of, of my constituents about this, and I think also there's like conversations in the education space about um, some seeing these 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 approaches as school hardening. You know, putting metal detectors in schools is uh, kind of a um, a pendulum effect of us moving in a direction towards wanting to secure our schools in ways because of recent gun violence that's been happening in a national level that we're all concerned about. So there are, are a lot of states that have been taking measures to implement programs like these. Um, but um, but also to mention that I think that there are restorative ways that we can address this too. And I think that um, this is just one approach. And so I'm sure we'll have other conversations about other approaches moving forward um, that aren't just metal detectors, but that are other ways, including mental health and addressing that in social emotional learning and, and other um, kind of research-based practices that actually do impact um, long-term outcomes. And, and we're also living at a time when the technology has advanced. So what people consider to be traditional metal detectors without divulging a lot of the technology is moving away from that. So the look is even different. So it's not it's not as though you'd walk into a school building as if you're walking into an airport, right, or corrections facility. Uh, the technology has really advanced. And I saw in a, a demonstration of the technology at the National School Boards Association uh, convention in Orlando. And it's pretty amazing uh, because it's almost, um, well, it's almost invisible. Like you, you don't see it but the technology is there to detect um, a weapon. So, uh, but you're right. I think, you know, issues of preventive measures, um, there's a lot of research on what can be done, but that is a larger community issue that has to, you know, engage on this issue besides just um, our school district. I see uh, our board member Rivera Forbes hand is up. Yes. So two things, just because the conversation did go a bit left there and I just wanted to add in, um, about the metal detectors and social emotional learning. I think that's extremely important because, and especially what you said, Chair Fields, just about making sure that we're understanding that it's outside as well. And in my case at my school, as everyone knows, this was outside of school property. This was not something that was conducted on school property. So it's extremely important that we are, again, talking to that delegation to our county council and ensuring that they understand that it's, it's much more than just having metal detectors and clear backpacks. It's so much more than that. It's really what's happening to our students every day and what's causing them to have some of these reactions. So uh, I think that's very important there, but, but we can discuss more of that later. Getting to my question that I had about the policy, I was wondering, Ms. Welsh, if there is an appeal process in case a student feels that they were, um, they were searched like improperly, or maybe there wasn't a reasonable search? Um, actually, that's a very good question. There, um, there's always uh, an appeal process. So, um, and I could look at possibly adding some language related to that, because in terms of it's really would be like a discipline appeal where um, it would come up, although the parent, the student, I, let me research it. I, it's, there, it. It doesn't just end there, you know, with the, with the uh, search, there's always can always be a follow-up. So let me see what I can find out. Thank you. Great. Um, I believe I saw board member, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right because I have yet to meet her personally, but board member Rao. Thank you, Chair Fields. I was, so I've been in listen mode, but you're in my area. So I 
definitely needed to say something. Um, and my area of expertise is uh, mental health. Um, and oftentimes when young people are searched, regardless if it yields a positive search or not, <clears throat> that may be very traumatic mm -hmm. for a young person. Um, regardless if they had contraband, I'm going to call it contraband um, for the sake of this conversa uh, conversation um, or not. And I, 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 I'm advocating strongly um, that they, there is something in the policy that allows them immediately after to check in with a mental health professional. To my understanding, um, with the opening of schools and the presentation that was presented to the board on September 7th, that we are adequately staffed um, in mental health. Um, and so this would be a step in the right direction um, to ensure psychological safety for all of our students, to ensure that they have um, a check-in, a conversation, whether it was yielded positive or not, which would, um, to my colleague's point, a uh, school board member, um, Riviera Forbes, um, that if indeed there is an opportunity where they felt violated, that would be the appropriate time that the professional would be able to guide them through the appeals process. Thank you. I, I appreciate those comments. And it made me think that we also have to make sure that in our skill, school buildings, we properly communicate to the student body the intent of the policy, uh, because oftentimes uh, these searches uh, are done in public where other students might see. Um, and so we have to make sure that the student body understands the policy and their rights. Um, and I think and I think that's very important. But I think the, the issue of being traumatized is real. Um, I was actually involved in a situation in my former school district in New Jersey where a young man was improperly searched and it really did harm. It affected him um, greatly. Um, I'm going to recognize uh, Chair Mickens Murray first and then uh, Vice Chair Briggs. Thank you, Chair Fields. Um, I'm appreciating the sensitivity that's uh, been in, displayed in this document. Um, Ms. Welch, I thank you for that. I also thank um, Board Member Rout and, and Student Board Member for adding the, the addition of having students recognizing that there is an appeals process. That's very important. And also, uh, Ms. Welch, where you said to ensure uh, that the dignity is there. If we're searching these children in front of other students, that's extremely important because the adults also have to adhere uh, to the policy and the peace of helping students to maintain their dignity. So I appreciate this. I think this is a good policy. I think it's real well written and uh, and I, I think we need it. So um, so thank you, appreciate it. Thank God, thank you guys. Vice Chair. Yeah, I wanted to just uh, take a, a moment to acknowledge what uh, uh, board member Rivera Forbes shared because I know that yesterday there was a shooting uh, in district two at uh, for of, of a student at Duval High School, and I know that um, board member uh, Rivera Forbes is a student at Duval, um, and so I just want to you know definitely acknowledge the um, that our our thoughts and condolences as a board as a whole are with that family um, during this difficult time, and that it you know it's a sad day for PGCPS to have lost a student, and as we're having these these discussions about violence and you know measures that we're taking to secure our schools, we also want to think about the external portions of the building when students leave and how we can also support them there. So I just wanted to echo um, you cautioning us about that and bringing that to our attention. Thank you. And, and one of the things that the chair intends to do is to convene a meeting with the county sheriff, county police chief, county state's attorney, so that we can have a discussion about that community impact. Um, and everyone should understand that uh, you know, a policy is only as good until it is broke. And and so, you know, we could have the best policy in the world and there could be an issue. And so I don't want to suggest that this policy is a cure-all. This is just another step that we're trying to take to make sure that when our students enter our buildings, they feel safe. When our teachers and staff enter the building, 
they feel safe. We should all want our students to walk into a building and return home safely. Um, and, that's, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, if there's no other discussion, um, I ask for a motion to either move this action on a policy or to keep it for further discussion at the next policy and governance committee meeting. Is there a motion? Do I have a motion? Uh, um, so I move to, um, can you repeat what, what it is, what the motion is again? And I'll repeat it back. Either move to action on this policy or keep it to a further discussion at the next policy and governance committee meeting. I move to keep this, uh, this specific policy for further discussion at the next policy and governance committee meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. I only heard one board member. All those in favor indicate aye. 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 Any opposed? The policy will be moved for further discussion at the next policy and governance committee meeting. Moving on to agenda item 4.4, .4, policy 1500, parent and community advisory council. At this time, I will yield the floor to Ms. Welsh to update us on policy 1500. So policy 1500, parent and community advisory council, um, the, um, there was, I did talk to the PCAC on last Wednesday and said, please share any changes that you might think are necessary for this policy. And they actually um, requested that we include um, some language. So uh, first of all, the reason why this policy came up was twofold. One was because PCAC asked for us to relook at the policy and I did invite them for, to come for public comment today too. So that anything they wanted to share. And then the second thing was um, they had had actually provided the board some recommendations for the policy. So the actual, um, so all the superintendents, all the CEOs were changed to superintendent. And then the language in um, 1079 talks about that the um, people that are appointed to the, um, to the um, PCAC, um, I think Ms. Welsh screen, I think she's froze. Ms. Adeline, if you could let Ms. Welsh know that her screen is frozen. I'll tell you, technology can bite you now and then. Um, actually, you were frozen, Ms. Welsh. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. So, if you uh, perhaps start from the beginning again, so that we can. Okay. So, what uh, the two ch the, there's several changes, not many. One had to do with um, the fact that the um, the law requires that when we're having a board having under standards if you go to standards that if the people that are included that are being members of the PCAC that are chosen recommended by the superintendent that members this is specifically from 1079 Cindy if you'll scroll down to um the standards yes here it is the, right there stop Okay, the, the point, the following members recommended by the superintendent, the members shall reflect geographic, racial, ethnic, cultural, and gender diversity of the county. So that was that specific language from the law that was passed this past year in House Bill 1079. And then based on the report that PCAC did provide, there they had the recommendation that um, where it says the parent county community advisory council, they asked that instead of it being just that they're giving, they're um, advising the board, they asked that it would say collectively advises the board and the superintendent. So I incorporate, incorporated that language in there. And then um, I'm going to see if there's any other 
language that was incorporated. I think those were the main changes that uh, they requested. Uh, oh, and the other one had to do with that uh, the chair and the vice chair and the recording secretary would be elected every other year. So they're in office for two years. And I think if you scroll down, you'll see that too. And those were the two recommendations from the PCAC. So uh, at this point, and since they're not here, I'm hoping they'll come to like, or at least give public comment at the, when they have the opportunity to give comment in case there's any other changes they'd like to make in the policy before we get to the point of where we're finalizing. But those were the changes at this point in time for the policy. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wells. The floor is now open for discussion and comments, board members. I see uh, Chair mickens Murray. Uh, do you want to go to your member first of the committee? And sure. We'll I'm sorry, I didn't see her hand. Yes, uh, Board Member Rivera Forbes. Sorry, quick question. Um, I know it says a board member, so I'm wondering if the two liaison roles is something that can still be kept or should that actually be included in the policy specifically? Oh. We could we could change that. Or if that's what the committee would like to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or saying the student member of the board is possibly able to serve as a liaison, that specific language, I think would be better. Because I know right now sitting in my role on the committee has made a great difference. And the PCAC members are very supportive of it. So if that can be something included there that the student member of the board does, I think it would look great. If the committee, I mean, it's perfectly fine with me. If this committee would like to move forward with that, that's perfect. I mean, we can absolutely add that language to the to the. To the I, I would, I would, the chair would like you to add that language. I, I think you know this. This shows you the value of having a student member of the board. It really does. Uh, chair Mickens Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Fields. Is there, um, Ms. Welsh, uh -huh. in this last year, we had two PCAC members to leave, but I didn't think we had a way to replace them in a policy. Did you include that in this policy? Did I miss it? Is it in, the, because if it's not, I think you should, uh, I think you should put it there. <laughs> we need to know how to replace them. I so um I will double check that, but uh, my understanding was that they that I mean and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but they uh, once you have a vacancy, it would seem to me you'd move forward to try to replace them as soon as possible because this is about getting representation from all the districts. Right, but I think you should say that if that if if that's the process that we want to use, then we need to say that, and we also need to put a time frame around it so that we don't wait for six seven months. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Explicit language. Any other comments? If there are none, Ms. Wells, please take under advisement the recommendations made tonight by the committee uh, on policy 1500 and bring them back to the next policy and governance committee for further discussion. Okay. Agenda item 5.0 items for review or action. Uh, item 5.1, school year 2023-2024, committee work plan. Um, I yield the floor again to Ms. Welsh to give us an update on the committee work plan. So, Cindy, are you going to... Um... Okay, so the, the at our last meeting, there was a discussion about moving the... Um, policy 1500 forward to tonight and so that was moved to tonight and we actually did discuss it as well as i did move the other policy parent family and community involvement policy 0105 forward um to to for october so that we um because that is also about parent engagement and involvement and so that way we can we can be addressing both of those as well as um i think those were the two main changes from our last meeting I will point out that um, we I originally had the student board member policy sitting for the September 12th meeting and the, the Board of Ed Professional Development for board members was um, back in uh, January. But when I went through the law, it actually, the, rec the student board members' rights to be able to vote in all these other areas and everything don't come in effect to July, 2024. 
but the requirements for staff professional development of the board members actually come in effect July 2023. So I thought, well, it takes several months to get through the process that would make better sense to put the student board member uh, to, uh, policy uh, closer to the end of the year so that by the time we get through the whole process, it'll be just finishing up in June and it'll be ready to go for July 1, 2024. And since the requirements for professional development are needed, or should be uh, be implemented now. I put that in made a policy for that one, so I did switch those two. So other than that, that is basically the your work plan for the um, upcoming year. And I believe based on policy eighty one hundred, um, when because I think each standing committee has the opportunity um, to uh, introduce all of their committee members and then talk about what their charges for the upcoming year. I think I think if the if the committee approves this and everything, it should be ready to go for that October meeting when they when it's the policy and governance time the committee's time to to share the charge. Thank you, Ms. Welsh, and and uh, committee members and public should understand that this is a working document. So uh, it's flexible that if there is a need because uh, the situation requires it, we can always move items up and we can move items down but this is guidance for the year for this committee and, and that we hope to be able to get through this entire agenda um, if we can, um, and perhaps um, even more if we can conduct uh, business. Um, colleagues, are there, any, are there any objections to presenting the school year 2023-2024 committee work plan to the full board? If there are none, the work plan will be presented to the full board um, at the next board me meeting. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 6.0, emergency items. I will ask, since I was not present, was there a, a proper motion to consider this item tonight? It, it was mentioned at the top of the meeting, uh, so we have not discussed it yet. Okay, so um, item 6.1, uh, uh, professional development for board members. Um, I will yield the floor to Ms. Welsh, but I will also state that this is an item uh, in response to uh, the last legislative session. And, and that's why we're, we're, we're dealing with this now. Ms. Welsh. So this, so this policy is um, pretty much word for word from the law. It lays out what all the requirements are that the law says. Um, it does talk about I, what I did in the policy statement. So if you look at um, um, education article, give me one second, um, 4 108. That lays out a lot of the responsibilities for board members in general, what, all the things. And when you think about all the things that board members are, are responsible for, th that really means they have to have a lot of information about a lot of different things. So I wanted to lay that out sort of as the policy statement because it is important to have uh, for them to have professional development so that they can really fulfill all their responsibilities. And so then this just, the purpose is just to provide the guidelines for the types of professional development that's required. I did define term because that's in the law and it talks about at the beginning of each member's term. Now, I I will, I did take the liberty to say each board member, but certainly will be glad to change it to what the law says. The law says each elected board member, but I thought, and please, please feel free to tell me to change it. It doesn't matter to me, but I, in my mind, I was thinking, um, that there's a good number of appointed board members on the board. And so all this information is really important information for all board members to have. So you might want to just have it for all board members. And in another year, it's not going to matter because it's going to be all board members because they're going to all be elected. But if you want me to change incorporate elected, I'll be glad to do that. But I did just put board members at this point. Um, and then it just lists out, um, well, if, when you become, when you first become a board member, you're, you're required to attend a orientation training. And then the, we're, we're, uh, uh, whoever is providing the training needs to provide training materials to clarify the role of the board member. And I do know that MABE does, the Maryland Association of Boards of Ed does provide a whole training session for new board members to sort of give them an orientation into their role. And then as far as the types of professional development that's required annually, the uh, law says it should be in community engagement, ethics, legal issues in education, parliamentary procedure, public education budget, budgeting and financing, role and responsibility of the board and any other subject determined to be relevant by the board. So those are the main areas. 
Um, I did add some language because we do have a policy, policy 9354, that talks about voucher reimbursement of expenses. And I thought this was the perfect, but it doesn't, it really just says travel expenses. There's no qualifications on that. So I thought it might be um, appropriate to say that board members are encouraged to attend professional uh, uh, develop, I forgot a word here, development conferences related to their duties and responsibilities as a board member and that the regist registration fees, travel and other expenses related to attendance of the professional conference will be provided if the board member provides documentation indicating the conference will be addressing these above topics. Because I, 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 So if you would like to change that, that's fine too. I just thought it would make sense that um, they get to know that, yeah, that'll be all covered but cost-wise if you're addressing these things. Then the other requirement that the law came up with, it says that on or before December 1 of each year, each board member shall submit a professional development disclosure statement describing the, the professional development activities the board member completed during the calendar year. And then again, this is right from the law, that on or before January 30th of each year, the board will post on the PGCBS website, the board member's professional development disclosure statements from the previous year. So, um, and then uh, they also talk about making sure that there are professional development retreats, which I know you, the, this board has done numerous professional development retreats. I think you've done a lot of training in those retreats, um, but I did incorporate that too, because that's what is in the law. As far as implementation responsibilities, I just said that the director of the board office would be responsible for ensuring that the professional development disclosure statements are posted on the website by January 30th. So, um, this, so this is pretty much, Worth not you know not complete word for word but basically covers everything was required in 1079 for professional development for board members. Thank you, Ms. Wilson, and I believe that we should probably keep the language of each board member and not elected, given where we are as a board, because that that language will be universal no matter if elected or appointed. Uh, so so I think we should keep that. Um, and and I'd also like to just reference that. Um, what this really is about is that none of us are professional Board of Education members. Uh, we all lead double lives. And so uh, the intent of this is to make sure that in our service to the board, we can be of great service to the public and to our children. Um, it's an effort to really make sure that we uh, are really keeping pace with developments in public education, that we continue to improve our skills um, as board members so that we can operate more efficiently and effectively as a board. Um, and the public should know that there are a number of opportunities uh, for board members um, to get professional development, whether it's through a state association, national association, or national convention and conferences uh, that, that take place. Uh, the floor is now open for discussion and comments. Excuse me. Board members have any comments? I see Dr. Zapora Miller. Uh, good evening. I was just curious about um, if, um, Ms. Welsh, if you can clarify, what is the um, statement that needs to be posted on the website or what board members need to submit. I know it's the law. Uh, I was just curious. What is, wh is what are they requiring of us to submit? And I'm I'm all for it. I think we should we should learn and we should grow in this role. I'm just trying to get clarification. What are we responsible to do to ensure that? So it, it says that each board member shall submit a professional development disclosure statement describing what professional development activities they had completed during the calendar year at the end of the year by December. So it's sort of like, you know, like a financial disclosure form, only instead you're actually laying out what professional development you completed over the over the the, the past year. Awesome, okay, thank you. And then that information uh, will be posted on the website, I believe, mm -hmm. of the board members' um, professional development activities. That's all part of uh, some transparency. Uh, Vice Chair Briggs. So this is a, this is actually completely off of topic. It's not about this, but I and I know for sure that this is the wrong time for this. But I I think well, we're I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to hold it just so that we are in keeping with the agenda. So when we get past this item, 
I'll recognize you because we have new business and we'll, we'll, we'll handle it that way. Um, so uh, if there's no uh, further comments, uh, can I have a motion from uh, a member to move this action, a uh, move to action on this policy or to keep it for further discussion at the next meeting? Dr. Zippor Miller's hand is raised. I'm sorry. I, I, and I, I apologize for monopoli monopolizing this. Quick question. It doesn't specify mm -hmm. that you have to go to certain P, uh, professional development. It just has to be in alignment with the work. Because I know there's certain conference we go to, like Cube and NAPSI and MAVE, but there could be other organizations that offer um, learning opportunities that would help us as, as board members. So it it leaves it open for us to ensure that we're investigating how do we need to grow as a board member in order to be effective in our role, correct? Yes, it doesn't. Okay. So it doesn't specify number one, who's gonna provide the professional development so you can go to whatever that addresses that. And there is a, a statement that also says, and this is in the law, any other subject determined to be relevant by the board. By the board. Perfect, thank you. Board member Rivera Forbes. Sorry, I know I said all board members in the language, but I just wanted to make sure the student board member is included in this, right? So that's a really good question. It does not say it says elected board members. Of course, a student board member is elected, but they're not elected in the same way. But you are elected by your constituents in a way. So I'm going to just do a little bit more research and look at the fiscal policy note just to make sure um, I, as a student board member, what is your thinking about this? For professional development with the Board of Education, I believe entirely that the student member of the board is a big component. And to be equal to my members and to really serve well with my colleagues, I have to make sure I'm learning alongside them to be a full active participant as well. So if there's a possibility that that can be included in there, and it also holds the student member of the board accountable as well, I think that would look great. And what I can do is put a definition that just says board members, and then it would say at this point in time, appointed, elected, and student board member. That way we know we're talking about everyone. I love that. Okay. Thank you. We consider our student board member a full board member. There's no there's no Thanks. bifurcation there. Uh, board, uh, board Chair Mickens-Murray. You're on mute, Board Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chair Fields, I was going to say the same thing. Our student board member has always been treated since I've been here as a full board uh, member. I mean, you had some conditions around voting, but they've always gone to training uh, with the rest of us. So that that was a good question. I just wanted to say once again that uh, this committee, this is, this is a proactive uh, policy because you recognize that we have to adhere to something that is new that was created by a house bill. And then to have it come out this quickly, I think I'm commending, uh, I'm commending the Policy and Governance Committee for having that foresight, getting this in place. No one had to come and say, hey, we need to do this. You didn't have to be reminded to do this. So I'm applauding you uh, for being proactive and seeing that Yes, we needed to put something in place so that uh, the po the uh, politicians, let us, legislators will see that we take the action seriously. So thank you so much. Thank you, Board Chair. Again, um, I will entertain a motion to move uh, to action on this policy or to keep it for further discussion. Is there a motion? I move to take action on uh, 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 the new policy, professional development for board members, um, and then to move it out of the full out to the full committee. Eventually. Is there a second? I second. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it, and we will move. Uh, this policy for further um, action. Um, moving on to agenda item 7.0, new business. I, I will recognize uh, Vice Chair Briggs. Thank you so much, Chair Fields. So I had a conversation with uh, Mrs. Welsh um, last week, and this was in response to um, 
the unfortunate passing of a beloved teacher in uh, at the Dora Kennedy French Immersion School, um, Miss Scylla um, Tour, um, Madam Scylla Tour. Um, and so we are, you know, um, our community, you know, was collectively shook. Um, I know that it was a, a number of us that were at her um, funeral and it was just uh, a really um, both a, an opportunity to celebrate her life as well as to um, reflect. And um, some of the things that came out of that, that kind of response to her unfortunate passing was um, a communications challenge um, with uh, communication to the school, communication to principals and releasing information. We, we know that there are investigations that occur in these types of situations. And so we don't want to impede in any way. Um, but at the same time, the community wants to hear from our uh, school district. They want to hear from our leaders around how they feel about this or what, what you know what exactly is happening. And then also, I think, addressing other issues like um, if there are going to be school closures or things that occur from that. So something that came to mind uh, for me out of this was around communications um, pertaining to emergency um, emergencies that come up in schools and how we address that. I don't know if we necessarily have a clear policy, and I talked to Mrs. Welsh about this, um, but wanted to introduce the idea of a board policy being added to the agenda for us to discuss communications pertaining to emergency uh, situations at schools so that we can just all have a kind of a clear understanding of where to go, who's releasing the message. Um, this was such a unique situation and, and we really do hope that it doesn't happen again in our school district. Um, but then we just had another unfortunate situation happen yesterday um, in, in district two as well. So the, it just speaks to the point that we really do need to have something um, where we can communicate these types of things to make sure that families are aware and that we're getting things out in a coordinated and collaborative way. So I wanna, um, urge my uh, colleagues to consider the importance of such a policy and to have that um, added to the agenda for, the, for this year. I think it's a point well taken. And what I would also suggest is perhaps the chair and vice chair of this committee uh, should meet with Superintendent House and have an initial discussion um, so that we're clear on uh, the administrative procedures uh, for releasing public statements. And then once we get a clear understanding, we can bring that back to the committee if there's a need to either uh, modify a policy or create a new policy. So um, I will get with my vice chair and we will begin moving on this because I think it's an, an important point so that we don't have so much public confusion or misunderstanding um, because a rumor mill is fast. And unless you get out there with communications first, um, you create some real problems. Um, I'm going to recognize uh, board member Ralph because I believe there was an issue that she also uh, wanted to bring up um, to the committee. Thank you so much, Chair Fields. Um, and yes, um, in my short time here serving alongside um, my fabulous colleagues, I identified um, maybe some um, policy gaps, perhaps, um, that I wanted to bring, um, to the attention of, um, my colleagues, um, in understanding the needs of children, um, and looking at equity, there was a disability issues advisory board, um, that is policy, Prince George's County policy 1700. And to my understanding, um, it's a great policy. It was um, it, it was introduced in um, two thousand and seven, um, and it was amended um, to be a new policy in twenty thirteen. But to my understanding, we do not presently have a disability issues advisory board. And I am just seeking um, the support of this uh, committee to revitalize the disability issues advisory board. Um, there are a couple things that um, in the policy, um, this advisory board is tasked to do. 
which is um, looking at issues related to board policies regarding access for individuals with disabilities <clears throat> within our school system as it relates to facilities, um, proposed new construction, um, and looking at employment and hiring issues. Um, so bring, bringing the relevance, like why is it important? Well, today, the county council unanimously passed um, a universal design bill um, as it relates to universally designing um, locations, housing, um, any type of building that includes design universally so that those with disabilities have access. Um, there are a number of issues that have been brought to my attention in this short two two weeks that we have been that our our scholars have been back to school that um, are sensitive to the needs of students with disabilities. Um, and if I could share, um, I do have a bias. I have two PGCPS scholars that um, I'm a parent of and proudly have disabilities. Um, and at our last um, update from our superintendent, we learned about the growing need um, of uh, supports and services for children with autism as it's um, rising at an alarming rate. And so I just wanted to, you know, just request your support in looking into how can we please revitalize um, the Dis Disability Issues Advisory Board Policy 1700. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Ms. Wells, we should put this uh, before our next planning meeting with the with the vice chair so that we can be ready for the next plan, uh, policy and governance committee meeting to have a discussion about this. I really appreciate that input. And, and, and that's exactly why uh, we need to have the viewpoints of everyone so that we're making sure we are covering uh, all bases. Um, if there is no other new business, uh, Follow-ups from previous meetings will be posted on board docs uh, upon receipt. Um, the only uh, closing remarks that I have is that the next policy, and, oh, I see a hand raise. I see uh, Ms. Dent, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to, um, well, and the, well, at this meeting, talk about um, policy 8100. Um, just for clarity, that policy um, was updated in April of this year. And, but I believe there is some misunderstanding um, around when the standing committees um, present at the board meetings, um, because in 21 and 22, they all, they had discussion at the board meeting um, in, in August. And although it didn't happen this year, we're looking at the um, committees wanting to present at the 21st board meeting, although the policy specifically states that um, the committee charge and your discussion um, summary around your work plan is, is given um, for OBAFA in, in September for policy and, and governance in October and for um, academic achievement in November. So while we had Ms. Welsh and and uh, Mr. Fields and team on the on the line, I just I needed some clarity so I would um, understand and not interpret what I believe it should be, to, but to hear what it actually is. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so I think that uh, Ms. Welsh and I, we should communicate and um, also with you, Ms. Dent, so we can be right in terms of that timetable. Um, I know we're probably a little behind this year, but uh, let's let's work that out uh, ASAP. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next policy and governance committee meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 17th, 2023 at 5 p.m. This meeting will be virtual. Uh, please check the board page on the PGCPS website for more information. Um, and in closing, I would just like to thank everyone for their participation tonight. I'd like to thank Ms. Adeline for her always stellar job in getting us ready. Ms. Welsh, Ms. Dent, I would like to thank my fellow committee members. I'd like to thank the public. Uh, we are a work in progress, and we are trying to do our best to make sure 
that the policies of our uh, board uh, reflect our best interest in making sure that we are providing our children with the absolute best education um, in the nation. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everyone. Um, colleagues, do you have any additional comments uh, from anyone before I request a motion to adjourn? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? I second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn the September 12, 2023 Policy and Governance Committee meeting. Any objections? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Have a good night and a safe week. Thank you, everyone.